Ok, on commence. Ok, so let's start. Vient votre amitié pour les Juifs? Where ça does your friendship for the Jewish people come from? From your, your youth? Jeune, Is this something that happened when you were young? I know that you're married to a Jewish woman, but support, when did it start, this Juifs, friendship and this support that you have for the Jewish people? Le judaïsme, on dirait. Il n'y a pas d'amitié pour les Juifs. De moi, moi j'ai une profonde amitié d'abord pour le genre humain, pour euh, il y a peut-être deux raisons. La, la première, I talked about it a little while ago. It's this link, this profound link between French history and Judaism avec ces pages glorieuses With these glorious et pages, ces moments terribles also comme au moment de la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. Moments, Il y a the Second World War. quelque chose, et c'est ça qui m'intéresse, What is of interest to me is there's something extraordinary terrible about the distress of French people, lawyers, writers, artistes, artists, commerçants, business men and women, professors, doctors, doctors, des hommes qui avaient fait people who did the First World War and had defended France. And all of a sudden, en 1940, in 1940, are asked to go to, um, to the police or to the town halls to declare that they are Jewish. And for most of them, they will lose their nationality or will not be able to conduct their, their business and lose their status. This was a terrible moment and from every point of view. But it was a profound wound of what France was able to do and a realization of how terrible things could be. Because of this, I think as, a, as France, we need to be able to rebuild this trust. But the second thing, and I don't think I need to be elaborate about this, is that in the history of humanity, I consider that what happened with the Holocaust is something that there were some very moving words that were said a few while, a little while ago that we need to permanently recall, not to make somebody feel guilty, but to make sure that our human conscience is always awake. And those are the two reasons that are behind my fight. Now, a lot of people forget that during the first decades of Israel, one of the strongest supporters of Israel was France, beyond the support of uh, the one that the United States. So what happened that changed that? That's true. France was a great supporter of Israel. All you had to do was to speak with Shimon Peres, who played such a key role in the end of the 50s. Um, and lots of delicate issues, such as armament and nuclear um, weaponry. So, qui continue d'une certaine this, manière, it's, qui a été faite like dans les années 60, et qui se poursuit. C'est un mistake qui a été fait dans les années 60 et qui se poursuit aujourd'hui. C'est de considérer que la France doit être ce qu'on appelle au Québec une stratégie arabe. Un privilège, une chance. As France, we have a privilege. We can talk to any country in the world uh, on an equal footing, footage. We can talk to Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and of course Israel. It is part of our diplomacy. We're a large country. We're permanent member of the uh, Security Council, and we need to keep this capacity and this dialogue. But we also need to come out, break out of this policy that explains this attitude that you just spoke about towards Israel and that the goal represented. Today, we need to say we are friends of Israel, not just because of history, not just because of this link that we have with the Jewish people, but because it is of our strategic interest and the values that we have in common. La discussion, we can, dialogue, of course, be open to conversation and discourse and discussion 
uh, with the, um, on the Arab countries, but we should be able to be strong about this. The other element I wish to talk about is that we should not, in our Western society and European countries, consider that there is a Jewish electorate and a Muslim electorate, and that since there are more Muslims in Europe, we should be giving the advantage of what Muslims would think. If we do this, we will um, break up our society. Our goal is to integrate Muslims in Europe without having a foreign policy that might serve their interests, that they're expecting what they want. In fact, it's simple. They want culture, a job, they want schools, they want to feel French. They don't want France to have a policy that criticizes Israel. So, since there's this terrorist threat, which is dangerous, you talk about Salafism and Judaism. So, tell us, do you really feel that France needs Israel because Israel has an incredible set of expertise, especially in combating terrorism? Is that it? Is that true? Does France need Israel to in this in this area and is it a need that is strategic is it something that you foresee favorably in the future and in our relationships absolutely i think any country that has to deal with terrorism each and every country should unite exchange information intelligence and strategies to fight against terrorism we have often in Europe thought that that was what was happening in Israel was completely foreign uh, to uh, something that might happen in Europe one day or the other. However, it is the same form of terrorism. Of course, the uh, geographic context is completely different. Israel is uh, uh, a society that has known war for, for, for a long time with a hostile uh, a political environment, and this is not the case in France, but, but the methods used against the Jews in France uh, were often the same as the ones repeated in Europe. So I have always considered and the people responsible uh, for the intelligence work in France also stress that we need to be extremely aware of what Israel is telling us to understand the objectives, the goals of terrorism, and that we need to be extremely attentive to what Israel tells us right now, for example, of the threat that Iran represents. And this is a strategic interest that we need to nourish to be more efficient against any form of terrorism, of any form of structure, of any individual, of any state. So I was talking to my friend David Siegel. So great to have you back. We loved you here for so many years. You were such a, you were a force of nature, David, in this city. You really were, you did so many great things. I'm curious, because you really, lived Israel activism in, in America for so many years, and now you're involved with, really, Israel activism in Europe, especially in France. Can you spend a few minutes telling us what's different about it, how much more difficult it is, and, and what's the nature of the challenge that you're facing now and how it differs from what you faced in America? First of all, um, I spent most of my career, as you know, uh, focused on pro-Israel uh, work here in the United States, not in Europe. Um, I spent years with Israel's foreign ministers, deputy foreign ministers, and accompanied them to Europe and participated in bilateral conversations and, and so on. Um, but I've been with Elnet for a year now, uh, since last December, and um, I've met repeatedly with my colleagues from, from France and from the other offices where Elnet uh, has operations, and you, you, you learn to understand how deep the differences are. Uh, first of all, the tradition, the American Jewish uh, tradition of pro-Israel advocacy is very deep um, in America um, and is very pervasive. Um, in Europe, uh, that wasn't the case. Uh, and as we mentioned before, 10 years ago, people didn't believe there was even a statement that uh, someone made in this community that 
raising money in France for political purposes would be like raising a hair on one's palm. Uh, it was something that people didn't believe, and, and it's actually true that that tradition wasn't developed like it was here in the United States. But I, I think the, the magic that, that we see here is that over the last decade, uh, we've seen pro-Israel activism develop uh, by very brave individuals that are operating in a context that you and I are not familiar with. We're used to a much more comfortable context where a community is well-versed, educated, and has spent over 70 years advocating for, for this cause. Uh, and that wasn't the case in places like France. And I am very proud, and I think we should all be proud of this achievement that over the last 10 years, uh, this is a community that has learned to hone the skills of advocacy and to step up. And you heard from the prime minister that even for the politicians, the environment could be very challenging to stand up and to make your voice heard uh, when it's not popular. Uh, and these folks have managed to galvanize their own community and then communicate with the politicians about what this means and what is at stake. So um, there are big differences. And, and beyond France, when you go into other countries, it, it gets even more challenging and even more rudimentary. Uh, and this is where we need to, to invest. Uh, but I think on the, the bottom line is we see uh, that this model of pro-Israel advocacy in the United States can be uh, applied in other political systems and applied successfully. So let's say you do succeed with politicians. Disons que vous avez du succès so let's say that you are successful with politicians. Uh, how do you translate that to the street? How do you... Uh, comment ça se traduit sur la rue? You, you know, so you you, you, you you have success with the leaders, okay, so but if uh, if a Muslim in one of those no-go zones in Paris hates the Jews, how is your work going to make a difference with that? Okay, well, so look, Elnet is the European leadership network, so you have to start somewhere, and uh, we believe that you start with the leadership, and then things trickle down. Um, I don't think the idea here is to go into Europe and convince every Muslim extremist to support Israel. That is not uh, realistic. Uh, but it is realistic to come to politicians and uh, to educate them about or explain to them what our common interests are and remind them that they have an interest, like you heard tonight, in building strategic relationships with the one stable uh, democracy in the Middle East in the midst of all of this global and regional chaos that we see that is affecting Europe uh, directly. And we're doing that leader by leader. Uh, and I, I, it's effective, it's, it's real, um, it's needed, uh, and I think we've per perfected the tools to make this a powerful movement. Uh, Mr. Valls, c'est la prochaine question, c'est pour vous. Okay, so my uh, next question is for you. La grande déclaration hier so the great declaration in the U.S. to support Jerusalem and recognize Jerusalem as the capital uh, of Israel has not had a good response in Europe. So what do we need to do? First of all, I would like to know your own opinion on the subject. What is your feeling, your sentiment? And also, I would also like to know what we can do so that Europe can, uh, can appreciate and support this decision a little bit better. I knew you were going to ask me this question. So, in a way, by answering this question, I can also answer the question that uh, David had. For a long, long time, for years, we told public opinion in Europe that when the problem between Israel and Palestine is solved, that all problems related to terrorism, anti-Semitism, and a great deal of difficulties in the Middle East would be solved. However, what has happened these past few years, of course, with the consequences of the second war in Iraq, the disintegration, um, dismantling of Iraq and Syria, with the Arab Spring, with the uprise in political Islam and terrorism and jihadism, 
a été la démonstration que ça n'avait rien à voir avec le problème israélo-palestinien. Je crois que les opinions européennes, cela l'ont compris. Ils ont compris, elles ont compris que l'un des problèmes majeurs que nos sociétés dans le monde avaient affronté, c'était la question de l'islamisme, de l'islam politique. Et c'est d'ailleurs un défi qui est d'abord lancé à l'islam. Et aux musulmans eux-mêmes victimes d'ailleurs de ce terrorisme. On l'a vu encore il y a quelques jours en Égypte, un attentat contre le mosquée. Et c'est ça qui paraît la priorité. Et la priorité de la communauté internationale aujourd'hui, c'est de traiter les conséquences des guerres en Irak et en Syrie pour que cela ne se reproduise pas, et en tout cas contre les besoins de la stabilité. Ça n'est pas simple, car il y a le conflit entre chiites et sunnites, il y a la montée en puissance de l'Iran, il y a le sunnisme qui est en très grande difficulté un peu partout, et il y a un terrorisme issu essentiellement du monde sunnite. C'est vrai au proche du Moyen-Orient, c'est vrai aussi au Sahel, en Afrique. Et c'est cela la priorité. Je réponds à votre question. Jérusalem est pour les Israéliens la capitale. Il faut le rappeler à chaque fois. C'est une évidence. C'est un choix qui a été fait par les dirigeants israéliens. Et d'ailleurs, on peut le comprendre pour des raisons historiques, philosophiques, religieuses, parce qu'on représente Jérusalem pour les Israéliens. Il faut le rappeler en permanence, bien sûr, à partir de 1948, et après la guerre de 1967, dans les conditions que l'on sait. Ce ne sont pas les Israéliens qui, d'ailleurs, en 1967, ont déclaré la guerre à l'Égypte ou à la Jordanie. Il faut rappeler ces faits, parce que dans les opinions européennes, on oublie souvent la réalité de l'histoire. Et on oublie souvent la réalité de l'histoire. Donc, on doit se rappeler ça. Est-ce que cette déclaration du président Trump règle les problèmes est-ce que cette déclaration apporte-t-elle la paix, la stabilité et une meilleure relation entre Israéliens et Palestiniens Est-ce que cela met en difficulté les relations internationales Il y a de la réaction des Nations Unies et des sources sociales européennes. La déclaration du président Trump est plus équilibrée et plus subtil que ce qu'on a bien voulu faire dire. Mais sans doute parce que c'est le président Donald Trump, c'est un peu plus subtil, mais parce que c'est le président Donald Trump, c'est aussi une réaction en Europe. C'est aussi une réaction en Europe. Et j'attends moi avec inquiétude ce qui peut se passer en Israël ou en Palestine dans les heures ou dans les heures qui viennent. Nous avons déjà vu ce qui s'est passé en Israël dans les heures qui viennent. Nous avons déjà vu ce qui s'est passé en Israël dans les heures qui viennent. Nous avons déjà vu ce qui s'est passé en Israël dans les heures qui viennent. Nous avons déjà vu ce qui s'est passé en Israël dans les heures qui viennent. Ce que je crains comme suite de cette déclaration, c'est que la question israélo-palestinienne reste importante. Regarding, of course, the situation between Israel and Palestine, the problem is is putting forth this subject, which is not a subject of priority that we have today. We have much more to turn towards what is happening with North Korea. So I'm being quite prudent. I understand part of the basis of this announcement. I understand the Israelis appreciate it, but I also see at this point that it can give rise to tensions. We need to, to uh, surmount these tensions. We have other problems, especially in the relationship between Israelis and Palestinians, and that's what we need to, to deal with. Are you in your own government? Is there opposition with your colleagues who are not as supportive of Israel as you have been? Do you have debates? Do you have conflicts? I'm very interested to know with French politicians. Oui, d'abord. Yes, of course, we, t we debate, we have debates, with, uh, we talked about it with Ari and 
Jean-David Benichou also, of course, there's, um, there's a misunderstanding of what the reality is in Israel, okay? So, especially amongst new generations who do not know Israel, who, does not, who do not know the history, the geography, the culture of Israel. And why is that? It's, it's an embarrassing problem, and it gives rise to so many tensions and has for so many years, up to yesterday, in fact. As I was saying, it wasn't on top of our agenda. I know I'm being very long here in my answer, but there's a theory in France, but not not only in France, by a few intellectuals and politicians from the left, Marxists, who consider that the, um, the working people, and we know that a few decades ago were uh, uh, workers. Okay, so I'm quoting this, of course, I hope that you're following me on this, that these damned people, these unhappy uh, lot, uh, now there's this idea that the ones who are part of this are Muslims, no longer poor people. In our European society, there have been the victims of colonialism, and here again I'm quoting racist states, such as France, would be interpreted as being racist towards its own children, but this does not correspond to the French truth, but this theory encloses Muslims in a single unit, but of course they don't share all the same opinions, and that most of them uh, are against against these anti-Semitic acts. But part of French politicians are prisoner of, uh, of this theory and are afraid to broach the subject because they're embarrassed. But I think, and I think that's why my voice is giving rise to so many debates, we have to pay attention, because if you accept to say that Israel is in question in the name of this theory, then we have lost our soul and we have lost the war. Is Israel a victim of its power? Because now weak people are popular, victims are popular in today's world, not people with power. So Palestinians have done an incredible job to show that they are victims and Israel, in truth, is, is now a powerful country. Do you think Israel is a victim of this? because it's such a strong oui, country. Yes, um, in this conspiracy theory, there's always the strong Israel ones on the one hand and the victims on the other. So of course, uh, you get into the uh, conspiracy theory that has all the basis of anti-Semitism. Now, I think we need to change the way we view all this. As Israel being part of a strategy, we need to be reminded that we share the same strategic interests and on the basis of common values, and this it was what is essential in the work we can do together. David, this one's for you. Tell, tell us one thing that you're very proud of, one or two things that Elnet has accomplished in the past year since you started in Europe and in France. I was saying that the week with the former Prime Minister of France uh, was quite an accomplishment uh, uh, for Elnet. And, and again, we want to thank, you know, you haven't heard him describe uh, what is happening in the Middle East that he does way better than any of us. So it's a rare combination of a man with, of principle, but also a man with an analytical mind that I haven't experienced, you know, outside of the borders of Israel. So it's, it's I think, something very unique. That's one accomplishment. Uh, seeing what our French colleagues have done. We're talking about France tonight. Uh, and you have to understand, you know, there are 28 or, you know, 27 after Brexit, 28 countries in Europe, you can't be in all of them with uh, or an organization of $5 million uh, uh, with a small budget like ours. But you can be strategic and you can focus on what counts. And what counts 
is France. What counts also is Germany. But in, in terms of policy towards the Middle East, the, the involvement of France in, in Lebanon, in Syria, in the areas where Israel is facing its most critical strategic challenges, to see a team like this take um, something that was nothing 10 years ago and develop a political machine that is in many ways uh, uh, reminiscent of what APAC does here in the United States, I think is an incredible, incredible accomplishment. Uh, and I think we, every day, we see, you know, with these politicians that come from Europe that don't know us, and to see their awakening and their understanding and their excitement about what Israel is. And, you know, we didn't talk tonight enough about, you know, what Israel provides to Europe today. And it's, like you said, counterterrorism. It's the partnership on, on how to deal with extremism online, in the streets, uh, how to deal with the challenges of Africa. Uh, you know, uh, uh, demographers are talking about tens of millions of people in Africa which, whose population is exploding, moving, migrating to the north. How do you manage that? Israel has 70 years of experience in Africa. Um, uh, natural gas, cybersecurity issues, uh, airport security, um, economic innovation. How do you develop an ecosystem of high-tech how do you uh, commercialize the innovation in universities? All of these things that Israel represents, water, drought management, all of these things that are important to Europe as well and to the rest of the world and to California as we know here. This is what Israel represents to these politicians if only they're given the opportunity to experience it and open their eyes to what Israel is. Uh, no, we're not like the economy of Morocco. So, you know, sorry, Morocco. We're, we're a global economy and, it's, and, and we have capabilities that are significant to Europe. And, and the, the, the key is to open the doors, to build the bridges, like Prime Minister Val said tonight. And this is what Elnet does. Let's provide that bridge for politicians to get to know each other um, and to build these very significant relationships that are important to both France and to Israel and to Europe and to Israel. Well, on that upbeat note, I want to thank Larry Hochberg, Prime Minister Valls, David Siegel. Thank you very much.